Hey, deserving listeners, let's watch the rest of Tiff's video. By the way, trigger warning because there's a lot of talk about intimate partner violence. And if you have trauma around this, you want to take care of yourself and maybe not watch this. So talk with your therapist, maybe. Let's let's watch. And if that's so, and this is indeed what you're referring to, which pretty much adds up, then it means that you just submitted on national television of opening my mail without my consent. That is a felony. Let that sink in. She also admitted to throwing a dog gate on me. And in the police report, you'll see her making a statement of mentioning anything, uh, nothing about a dog gate. Instead, her first testimony upon re arrest says that she hit me multiple times. And then in the second testimony, she got cuffed. She said that she did not hit me, that I'm too strong for her to hit. And that doesn't. Okay, this is interesting and trigger warning, obviously, this whole series of episodes, but maybe this particular passage. I think this is a police report, allegedly, that Tiff is publishing. Quotes from Mildred. I didn't want to be around her anymore, so I pushed her away from me. She began to hold my arm and tried to calm me down. Okay, she began to hold, she began to hold my arm and tried to calm me down. Well, that's interesting. But this first sentence, I didn't want to be around her anymore, so I pushed her away from me. So according to Mildred, Mildred was trying to get away from Tiff, and then, and then Tiff grabbed Mildred's arm and said, calm down. And then I pushed her off of me because I didn't want her to hold me anymore. She got out of bed and told me I was a trash mother and walked away. I followed her out of the room, and once again, she called me a trash mother. So, by the way, I don't know if I show this clip, that Tiff admitted and stood by the statement that Mildred, because you know, Mildred during the reunion was saying, Tiff called me a trash mother, and we didn't hear any response from Tiff at the time, but Tiff is now saying, yeah, I, I did occasionally call, or at least once, call Mildred a trash mother or indicted her parenting skills because Mildred would often do a lot of things in front of the kids, fighting, for example. I would often tell Mildred to stop that. And so, yeah, I, I would criticize her parenting. And uh, yeah, I, I imagine that that was a part of it. You know, I could also imagine, uh, even if you are being victimized, that you might be occasionally a jerk face about someone else's parenting. It doesn't mean that you're not a victim. So who knows? But now, what are the ways that one can convince someone to pay attention to parenting more, you know, just calling someone a name isn't necessarily the best way. But, you know, under the circumstances, we can imagine that things would escalate to that point going on. So in another statement, sounds like maybe later, according to Tiff, uh, Mildred provides another statement to the police. I did not hit Tiffany out of anger today. So admitting hitting, I did not throw a dog fence at her. It was really heavy. I wouldn't throw that. I never punched Tiffany in her shoulders. I threw my own phone, but I never threw her phone. I never pushed her against the wall. I can't push her. She's too strong for me. This doesn't make sense. Okay, well, I don't know. I don't know what to make of, of these accounts. Um, could Mildred be lying? If, if Mildred is a perpetrator, then yeah, they typically will lie when the police show up. Could Mildred and Tiff have different memories and there's some truth to what Mildred is saying here? Maybe, but it doesn't really change the overall look. And that's really one of the main things that I wanna establish here is that you can't tell from one, or it's hard to tell from one instance, even if someone is being violent with another person, you can't tell the overall pattern. Abuse, that word is used in a lot of different contexts, but typically when we're talking about an abusive relationship or we're trying to determine if someone is a victim of abuse or we're trying to determine if someone is a perpetrator of abuse, we're talking about ongoing we're talking about a pattern. We're talking about a breaking down of someone's, of the victim's sense of safety and their sense of agency. We're talking about a prolonged relationship where there's a progression typically. And that's what we're talking about when we're talking about the cycle of abuse or what we're trying to end when we say end abuse. Now, of course, we would also be potentially saying let's end individual abusive acts, but there can be an abusive act within a relationship and not the overall pattern of abusive behavior that would cause a victim to feel ongoing victimization. So when we even go over the details of this police report, we can't really know what that means to the overall relationship. A lot of data is given to us on camera, and I guess now from TIFF, that points much more, you know, let's say in this, in this police report that Mildred is 
completely accurate, that if there was a video camera, everything or most of the things that Mulder is saying here is accurate. That doesn't mean that Tiff wasn't a victim of ongoing abuse. So I don't know if it really matters what we think of this police report. Mulder has power and control over them, not just physically, but emotionally. It's contradicting, and as always, things are twisted to the point where she can't keep up in a desperate attempt to fit her narrative. And as far as the rent situation goes, when you're being gaslit for so long to back in the reunion, I essentially became so confused and I was thinking of eight or nine other accusations she laid on me and shifting it right to another accusation, which again is abusive. And I get to a point where I become so confused and flustered that I barely even know what I'm talking about at this point. Yeah, it did look like that. And that gets back to what I was saying in an earlier video that victims and shall we say non-perpetrators in general, when you are in a conflict and a debate, there's at least some semblance of trying to be logical or trying to be reasonable, trying to uh, debate on good faith that the other person is also at least kind of open. Now, in most conflicts, that's not necessarily true. But the problem with that assumption for non-perpetrators is that when the perpetrator just throws a lot of stuff at you and they're so sure of themselves and they've been often rehearsing these things because through trial and error and they're a bit obsessive about this using this ammo they have rehearsed it in their head they they have a solid argument that they're going to make the argument none of the points of the argument might hold any water all of it might be ridiculous but they have it all kind of laid out and they're throwing it at you, whereas you have not been rehearsing. You don't have ammunition at the ready because that's not how you're oriented. And so all of this is coming at you and you, you try to respond and you start, wait, and, and you also, it's natural to forget. Also, your fight or flight is kicking in. Your brain isn't working quite right. And you start just thinking, wait, so maybe, are they right about that? Did that happen? And, and it just keeps coming and coming. And the uh, the effort uh, on the part part of the non perpetrator uh, to try to work something out is used against the victim because the the perpetrator is not there to work anything out. They're there to control, and so the only solution often to these interactions is to just not engage. Now the problem is though, if you are a victim, especially currently, but in the future. You need to have a lot of measures in place, depending on the level of danger, but let's just always assume there's a much higher level of danger than even you would think, because sometimes it is that way, that you need to have a lot of measures in place, a lot of support, a lot of treatment, a lot of power, a lot of people on your side, a lot of resources, a lot of options like you have a way out of the house, you have a go bag, you have keys to the car, you have a friend that you can call and you know that you're gonna be at a certain place to pick that, you know, there's all these systems in place. Because even if you're gonna do anything like this, like you're gonna not engage, as I said earlier, the perpetrator will not like that. <laughs> to not engage with a perpetrator when they are shotgunning and machine gunning a lot of things at you will be a threat to them and they will escalate because if that doesn't, you know, usually that will work to discombobulate you and or at least keep you engaged where you're just like, no. And we saw a bit of that with Tiff and, and Mildred when they were in front of the fireplace, right? That Mildred was just throwing all sorts of stuff, and you see Tiff trying to re, trying to refute certain things, and, it, and at no point, and I mean, Mildred did eventually kind of soften up, uh, so we'll give credit where credit's due there. But anyway, so when that's happening to you, and you push back and say, "I'm not gonna, I'm just not gonna participate," that will very much provoke the perpetrator because one, you're taking away their power, which is the way to safety for them, uh, often. And they will perceive that as you pulling away from them and you gaining your own power. There's a lot of implications there, right? Meaning that not only do you have a choice to not engage, which is a huge threat to the abuser, also it shows that you have your own mind, that you, th you have your own thoughts. <laughs> and without, especially if the abuser is that style of abusive person, that's very threatening and it's very scary to them and it's dangerous to you as a victim. So you can't just do what I was saying earlier, unless you have a lot of measures in place to react if 
it escalates, right? So I'm not saying that's what you should be doing, uh, depending on the situation. I've been in situations where I was being abused, but I wasn't under their thumb. I wasn't married to them, for example. So I had a very easy ability to extract myself for the most part. And so I could draw a boundary like that, knowing that I didn't need a lot of measures in place to protect me because the, the abuser didn't have that much control over my life. The actual scene between Mildred and I lasted around 15 minutes. Not the five minutes that you saw. It kept going and going and going, and it would not stop. Yeah, I don't doubt that. It looked that way. Mildred was bulldozing, was very rigid, very sure of herself, and just throwing all sorts of stuff. And you saw Tiff trying to react, and even physically, you see Mildred standing tall and very pointedly, very squared up against Tiff and going after them verbally. And you saw Tiff just, huh, and then panic and, and run off. So yeah, I don't doubt that they cut that out. Why did they cut it out? We don't know. Maybe they cut it out because they're trying to make Tiff look bad. I don't think so, though, because the there was enough there to make Mildred look like a bulldozer, look abusive. So I'm guessing they just cut it for time. It was actually kind of weird how short the reunion was. My impression is they're shooting the reunion for several hours. By the time Tiff walked outside, it was dark outside. I think they were in Southern California, typically dark around six, seven, eight o'clock or something, depending on the time of year. And I'm guessing that they were there early in the morning. So they have a lot of footage and they only showed a, a small portion and they only touched on a small portion of topics. And honestly, when I think about it, I think it's just the general guideline that this production company follows the love is blinds, the ultimatums, that they don't want to be like other reality TV shows where they have a lot of detail given. They want to make it as, as short and sweet as possible because you want people wanting more. You don't want them getting bored watching. Shows like 90 Day Fiance, they'll take a pretty you know simplistic storyline and really string it out literally for 30 episodes. They'll have a reunion that lasts for four episodes. Each episode is two hours long. And there will be slow moments, right? <laughs> so I think part of the success of these shows is how condensed it is. So it was probably just that because they, they could have easily cut that whole scene out, right? Or they could have cut it to make Tiff look overreactive. It, it didn't, at least it didn't look that way to me. But yeah, I don't doubt that what Tiff is saying here is accurate, that it, it was three times as long and more involved than what we saw. Being gaslit on national television, like over your morals is something I can't even comprehend to this day. And when it came to the rent situation, I actually thought that she was talking about utilities at that point, because when you are thinking of accusation one, two, three, four, and you don't even know what the fuck is reality anymore, pardon my. Okay, well, that's the end of that video. I am really glad I, well, okay. So it looks like Tiff is telling the truth. And if so, then I highly commend Tiff for putting this out there. And I'm so happy that if Tiff is telling the truth, what it looks like they are, that Tiff was able to extract themselves and not only get out of the relationship, but also to extract their mind, to return to a stable sense of self and knowing right from wrong and not being gaslit anymore. It looks like Tiff has arrived there, which is a big deal. It could take a long time. I'd be curious as to what helped Tiff to recover in that way. Maybe I'm guessing a lot of support. Who knows? If, if Tiff is being accurate, which it looks like they are, then this is a happy ending to a sad story. So there's that. Also, I commend Tiff for putting this out there. A lot of people have benefited from watching this. A lot of people have reached out to Tiff, from what I understand, and I'm guessing some lives were saved. Some relationships were saved. Some people were saved. Some children were saved by Tiff speaking out. And I guess by extension, the show showing us what this can look like, right? Although I, I wonder what the overall consensus was for people watching. Yeah, because I live in this world, and a lot of y'all live in this world too, it was easy for us to see that something was amiss, that there was some signs. There were some signs of intimate partner violence just from watching the show, even before the reunion. So for us, that's perhaps what we saw, and it was 
clear, but I don't know if the general public would have seen that. In fact, I'm going to take a guess and say that, that they didn't, that they just thought it was conflict. They might have even seen TIFF as the problem. Often people will frame things financially, and Mildred accused TIFF of mooching off of Mildred, not paying rent, that kind of thing. TIFF went into it and actually was explicit in saying, I, I did pay half the rent. There were just some other things that, I, I don't know, but it, it, that doesn't matter even if TIFF didn't pay the rent. That doesn't mean that it's okay for Mildred to be violent and to abuse TIFF. So I don't know. I, I, I worry that the a portion of the audience watching it would be really focused on that uh, mooching accusation because during the show, Tiff didn't provide any evidence against that. I think because Tiff was being gaslit and confused and they also edited in a certain way. Because I've seen that before, like on 90 Day Fiance, for example, there will be a lot of talk in the viewership that's really centered around money and who is scamming who for money. And certainly that can be a thing uh, that happens on the show and it's pretty egregious, but sometimes I feel like the viewership is applying that criterion and focusing on that when there's a lot more detail being presented to us, right? And um, so, I don't know. Of course, it makes a lot of sense. There's a lot of people who are struggling financially and that's what they're thinking about day to day, hour to hour. And so that's what they're focusing on because first things first with survival is being able to pay your bills, roof over your head, food for your kids and yourself. So I imagine it's it's an outgrowth of that. I don't know. Or it's just an easy thing to attack people for. I don't know. I, I'm, I'm just worried about the general public's interpretation of what happened or even just even noticing. So that's another reason why it's really great that TIFF brought this up, if TIFF is being accurate, which it looks like they are, but I can't know. <laughs> I've, I've been wrong before. I've, as a couple therapist, I will hear stories from couples and I at first will hear one version and it seems very believable. And then I hear the other version. I'm like, oh, and then I investigate more and it's a third story that I end up landing on. So, you know, I can't know, but you know, it definitely looks credible. Does it not? There's a lot of things pointing in that direction. So I commend Tiff for coming forward, putting this out there. You know, there'd be a lot of reasons why Tiff wouldn't want to put this out there, would just want to move on with their life would perhaps not want to piss off Bildred. I don't know, but it's possible that Tiff even knows that this could activate Bildred even more. Abusive people, if Mildred is abusive, they be can sometimes become obsessed. If this video is out there, the abusive people will sometimes, this will set them off for 10 years of a campaign of digging up dirt, fabricating accusations, and publishing those to, because when you manage to gain some control over the abuser, their tactic is to not only meet uh, fire with fire, meaning that they don't just reciprocate, they will do it tenfold, a hundredfold to make sure that you never do it again. And because of their obsessiveness about this sort of thing and the level of anger that they feel, it will drive them for years of trying to get rid of you, to try to counter it and to convince everyone how wrong you are. So Tiff's really putting themselves in the crosshairs if Tiff is being accurate about this. So that's brave. Also, the internet can be a really horrible place for a variety of reasons, not only to victims, but also to queer people. So there's that. I mean, I wouldn't doubt that there are anti-queer people who are going after TIFF just because they're queer and saying really awful things. I, I, in fact, I, I'm quite sure of that. So just putting yourself out there as a queer person is a, is a risk, even if you're just talking about something non-controversial like puppies or something. So it, it, it's brave of TIFF to do that as well. So, you know, good for them. I guess another aspect to this is that Traditionally, in the rare instances where we do talk about intimate partner violence, it's most often discussed when you have a heterosexual couple and the husband is the perpetrator. But we know, 
because it's obvious and it's also shown with research and clinical uh, experience that it doesn't matter the orientation, sexual orientation or the gender, anyone can be abusive, anyone can be abused. So it's perhaps another educational aspect to this that, okay, even queer relationships can involve intimate partner violence. That is also possible. For some people, I could imagine they would literally think that, well, wait, women can't be abusive. Literally, a lot of people believe that. They'll be, well, that's not possible. Or they would look at Mildred and Tiff and say that Tiff looks stronger. And thus, how could Mildred abuse Tiff when Tiff seems to have more physical power? We don't even know if Tiff does. I think Mildred was claiming that to the police. But that's also ridiculous. You can be abused by someone who is very small and would never be able to physically harm you. The thing is, though, harm can take many, many forms. Also, all you need is a knife or a gun, and you could be tiny and kill someone. So it's not a matter of your muscle mass <laughs> to to threaten someone and make someone feel unsafe. So that's another aspect to this that is, I guess, helpful to the general society. And, you know, this show seemed to be watched by a wide variety of folks, people that might not have exposure to this sort of thing. Because, you know, it's in my world, everything I'm saying right now is obvious and often discussed and um, researched and well understood. So sometimes I forget that a lot of people, especially when you consider around the world, uh, the ideas that are presented to us on the show and by TIFF now are very novel and mind-blowing and really require paradigm shifts that I might have made when I was a lot younger, you know what I mean? So we can't assume that everyone gets that. J just along these lines, just a little tangent. When I was a student in graduate school, I noticed that some of the professors because they had learned so much, you know, the professors were so far beyond my knowledge level that when they were given a chance and they had the power to do so, they would design classes or lectures that were more interesting to them, but way over my head. And that will happen sometimes where it's, it's hard for us to, we can get bored, any of us can get bored talking about fundamentals, things that is obvious to us because we learned them a long time ago or we just know them. And it's tempting as educators or people online to speak from that place of just like, well, we don't even need to touch on that because it's obvious. There is a good chance that a lot of those things that we take for granted, a lot of those things that are obvious to us are extremely mind-blowing for a lot of people around the world, especially when it comes to anything related to queer people. So uh, it was um, perhaps really helpful, not only to have this example, but really everything that was portrayed on the show, that queer people can fall in love, that there's gender fluidity, that queer people have all the same ups and downs as, you know, they have very relatable experiences. They fall in love. Some of them, like Mal or Xander, seem to be pretty differentiated. Others, not so much. Wow, there's a wide variety. They they have a wide, wide variety of looks and presentations. And, and, and instead of stereotyping and pigeonholing, you know, to me, it's just normal. <laughs> you know, I have a lot of queer friends, have had a lot of queer friends. I have queer people in my family and have for a long time. So... To me, it's, you know, in Seattle anyway, it's just obvious, right? But to a lot of people, it's not. <laughs> I mean, sometimes I have to remind myself that the fact that I'm Asian American and I'm fourth generation, my grandparents, my Japanese grandparents were born in the United States and didn't speak Japanese is extremely novel to be, wait, so you don't, you're Japanese, but you don't speak Japanese. And I, I, I said, of course, for me, <laughs> that's obvious, but there's a lot of people that you know, just lack experience or something, or they have bias, or they haven't gone through uh, uh, courses that dismantle stereotype and talk about all that. So, you know, sometimes we have to just start from the beginning. <laughs> so uh, the show, being a mainstream show, which it, it is arguably, I think did a lot of work there. And, um, you know, so I'll commend that. Are there some problems? Sure. But you know, overall, I think it, it's a wonderful thing. And since it was successful as a show, it shows that marketers, because that's all it comes down to is making money. They are like, ooh, we need the next queer love, right? We need, we're, we're, they're probably in the, in the works right now. There's other competitor reality TV show programs going like, oh, we need 
more of this content. Look how look how much it's look how well it's doing. And someone has to be that first foray to put a good quality show out there so that it can be demonstrated that there is a market for that. And so, you know, I I'm really happy about that. So anyway, I guess I'm wrapping up the whole thing because I imagine this might be the last episode that I make because I'm not planning on watching more interviews and that kind of thing, uh, mainly because I, I just, I might watch them, but I, I don't know if I can add value by spending the time and making videos about it. And also I'm trying to transition work to other things, deep dives for the for the audio podcast, that kind of thing. So I guess this is a wrap up for that. I feel like I already kind of wrapped it up when we watched the end of the reading, but I will do it again briefly and say, what a ride. If, you've, if you're watching this, in all likelihood, you were there throughout the whole thing. And I um, value that a lot. I follow certain YouTube channels myself. And, you know, I'm sitting here alone in a room and you're probably sitting alone in a room or maybe with your partner or something. And it, you know, it feels like an intimate thing. You're having your reaction, commenting below maybe, or yelling at the screen <laughs> or something. And I am reacting. And so I don't, it feels uh, kind of uh, intimate, like a close relationship to me. I depend on knowing how you feel about things and uh, also th you watching. <laughs> Because yeah, I wouldn't be doing this if people weren't watching. So it's it's been a journey, you know, like some kind of excursion together that we've gone on. Like we've ventured into the wilderness, not knowing where we were headed. And then we do a full loop and come back home and we are saying our, our goodbyes until next time. And we're saying, okay, well, it was, wow, what a, so many memories, so many experiences we had together. And um, good night, hug, uh, I'll see you tomorrow, and we'll go on another adventure. And until then, everyone, please take care of yourself because you deserve it. You really, really do.